So you think the battery's dead? That figures. Don't have Danner mic'd up using an old mic, old camera. Yeah, you, you have not driven it. Uh, only in, and uh, I, yeah, and I noticed it has like a little like hesitation. It has a rich, rich condition is what we're chasing. Yes. The guy's had his hands everywhere in it. New engine here, wait, oh, I can give you his. Give me the brief rundown, I don't want the whole letter. I want the brief rundown. System rich, recently replaced the motor. Rebuilt engine has like 70 miles on it. 2007 Suzuki 5 SX4. SX4, okay. Okay, things that we replaced with the motor, spark plugs, coil packs, new fuel injectors, new seals, new intake manifold, exhaust manifold gaskets, new converter, upstream and downstream sensors. I have to find- When the MAF was replaced. But that was two years ago when it, the original one failed. Okay. New camshaft, new crank sensor, new purge valve. He said, I was getting a rich code with a misfire on every cylinder. The misfire code went away when I replaced the spark plugs and coil packs. Okay. Well, let's hope we can so, hit it quick and yeah. yeah, we'll see how it goes. But we need to charge it. I think I should drive it. So you, oh, the tires are flat. <laughs> All right, people, what are we working on? The Suzuki, we'll do a code scan, pre-scan. Battery was dead, so. Who knows? All right, what do we got? Engine code, zero. Airbag codes. We got some BCM codes. Lost calm with ECM. Tire, a bunch of tire pressure sensor stuff. Four wheel drive. This is four wheel drive? There is a two wheel drive auto and lock switch. I assume that means it is four wheel drive. Go into the engine and start it up. All right, I do have a hose on this, guys. Don't want carbon monoxide poisoning. I'm making a mistake not driving this. Tires are flat, battery's dead. All right, starting it. Uh, I'm pretty sure that sensor should be giving me a milliamp number right off the bat. These wide bands get heated by I don't know, a couple amps of current flow. I didn't see any heater data parameters, but yeah, I would I would expect that oxygen sensor to be giving me some type of milliamp reading already. Yeah, neither oxygen sensor's done anything. It, it is saying that they are inactive. So it looks like I'm starting to heat that downstream sensor. All right, there we go. Now we got a minus one. It's in closed loop. Right away, we're minus 18% fuel trim. Total trim is going to be a combination of long term and short term. Uh, long term is at zero right now. So you'll see these two numbers be real close to each other. The short term percentage bank one and then the bank one total trim will be close. Yeah, this upstream sensor is. I mean, I don't know, it's not moving like I would expect it to. Yeah, downstream sensors reporting rich 900 millivolts they're both saying active now down here i didn't see when they both turned on yeah i mean i should see some type of milliamp changes here and it's pretty much stuck at zero and when i snap it a couple times i can get it to change So let's do a decel fuel cut. Just kind of watching that downstream sensor. Um, anytime you have a rich condition, guys, you, you've seen me do this before. We, we question the sensors. Are they reading accurately? Both upstream and downstream. In this case, I have an upstream that really isn't moving all that much. And um, I, I, I'm not sure of the data parameter range. Usually about four milliamp swing on these things. And um, so I'm going to use the downstream to give me a guide to whether or not this is an actual rich condition based on the trims that are, you know, minus 20% roughly. And it looks like the downstream is accurate, that, that this is an actual rich condition. And here's how we can determine it. We're already rich. What I want to do is enter a lean cut mode 
And to get into that mode, I need the RPM to be high and I need to be decelerating. The computer will then shut the injectors off. And that'll be the, the ultimate lean condition that I can create. Um, I used to teach pull a large vacuum hose off, watch for the O2 to go lean, and this is just much easier. So watch, I'll snap the throttle. And you see that whole deceleration range, that would be right in here. We had a full lean oxygen sensor. So that downstream is reporting accurately. This is an actual rich condition. This is not a, uh, um, uh, a false rich on the, on the downstream sensor. Um, uh, let me rephrase that. That downstream sensor is functioning properly and the fact that it's full rich and our trims are negative is telling me we need to focus on this upstream sensor. Uh, this upstream sensor doesn't look right to me. He changed this upstream sensor? He did. It's, it's not right. No. No. I mean, I'm only looking at a milliamp draw right now. Zero, and it don't want to Yeah, and I don't but like... If I like, create a vacuum leak, it'll work. It'll go to negative or positive, but... It, like, but if I do... There's your D-cell fuel cut. Uh, it looks like the D-cell fuel cut, it'll go to positive two, right? On the, on the lean side. You see that? Yeah. So... So I was just telling the guys like here and here, there's your D-cell fuel cut mode, making the downstream sensor lean. Yep. And there's your D-cell fuel cut, making the upstream sensor go to two milliamps. Now every car is different in how they report that data. You know, like Toyota will, we even had that one car, two different Toyotas reporting completely different. One was a Lexus, one was a Toyota, one was a five wire or six wire, and the other was a four wire. And even those report differently too. I'm gonna go global data here for a second to help me out. The other thing I didn't like on the warm-up danner is how long it took for it to war that front sensor to do anything. All right, what do we got here? This is still giving this to me in milliamps, but that looks like it's moving now. Seeing similar parameters on the D-cell cut, 1.7 milliamps. I think we had two on the other. And if we're already, it's, it's possible that that's already full rich, but here's the thing. It's also been compensated for. So what I'm getting at here zeros where we want to be to see the full rich side um, I can't really show you that here because I can't hold it at wide open throttle long enough you see some dips yeah I can't do it I guess here what I'm getting at here guys is is this sensor accurate or not make a rich condition the computer can't compensate for and and see the rich side of this sensor let's get out of here let's go back to the factory data see what kind of bi-directional controls I have turn the purge valve on so it's not letting me with the engine running that's stupid yeah, under the global data pit, it was giving me some uh, better, better looking zero numbers. It was moving. I just want to rich in the mixture and see see what it does. It has been compensated for. I I think it's okay, to be honest with you. Pretty freaking rich. Thirty percent roughly trim. Just look at your total. That's your total trim is going to be short term plus your long term, and just look at them together. And they're updating it looks like at a little bit different times but so the total trims around 28 percent at idle let me raise the rpm it's significantly better i believe this oxygen sensor data parameter is crap 
we saw it better in, in the generic mode. It's better at higher RPM. Mass airflow suspect, injectors are suspect, fuel pressure, incorrect purge, contaminated oil, head gaskets, timing, injector flow, wrong injectors. As far as the engine goes, the mass airflow grams per second, anything under a three liter engine, we really can't use the liter and compare to grams per second. I've certainly seen contaminated mass airflows do similar to, uh, to what we're looking at, over fuel at idle. Just wondering if this has a decent backup strategy for the math. Let's see what kind of engine load we're showing here. 40%, that seems kind of high. Okay, I'm gonna unplug the math. Let's start easy. And an air tube off there. Looks like that's my math. 5 wire. Let's see if this has a default strategy. Key off. Wait 5 seconds. Key on. Math out of the picture. So intake air temps, part of that mass airflow. My calculated loads down to 25%. Doesn't want to idle. Got an open loop fault message. Yeah, it really does not want to idle at all. Long term trim uh, memory, when it kicks in, watch what it does. Watch the long term. Now, right there, minus 20, car stalled. I think this mass airflow is the issue. We get lucky the first, first check. So it's idle and fine, idle and fine, idle and fine. Watch as soon as that long term comes into play. It's taking all the fuel away. Now that we're measuring airflow properly, I think, not exactly properly because my um, <clears throat> sensor's unplugged, but my calculated load's like half. Let's see if we can make this long term Learn. It, it, it's saying open loop fault, so it knows that there's an issue too. Okay, let me let me see if I can clear this fuel trim memory. Clearing codes isn't going to do that. Yeah, that's not going to let me. see the, the calculated load value based on parameters of what it expects is like half. Let me see if I can keep this thing running. See if we can update this trim, although it's probably not going to given it has an open loop fault. Yeah, it's just not letting me. At idle, it's trying to pull that fuel away. Okay, I'm gonna try something here. I'm gonna disconnect the battery. I'll clear that memory. We'll pull that math out next, take a look at it. I just want to prove a concept here. I believe that the car stalling is because of the minus 20% trim. And I think if I can get rid of that trim, the car's not going to stall. I should say learned trim. Now that may not have cleared that memory. Let's see what we got. Calculated loads 25%. Low idle speed. Rough but I'm in an open loop fault mode. I'm gonna rev it a couple times. Not a great backup strategy, but the fact that it's that much better, let's see if we can get this sensor warmed up. All right, let's just get an idea of some numbers here. Even though this thing's idling low, I'm at like 500 RPM. I didn't pull the desired in. You'd think it would try to raise the RPM. Why would it not? Where's my desired idle? Pull that guy in here. Desired is 729. 
It's showing an IAC percentage. I, I, I don't even know if this has one or if it's electronic throttle control. Let me hold the RPM at the desired. I'm, I'm trying to get a plugged in, unplugged comparison. And I don't know that I can do this because I'm open to the throttle to do it. So that's at a thousand RPM. I'm holding my foot on the throttle a little bit. 2.6 milliseconds. Calculated load of 24%. And by the way, I let my foot off. We're not seeing that same minus 20 stalling condition. As soon as it go minus 20, it'd stall. So remember those numbers. Let's, let's go to a thousand again. Let's try to, try to get it there. 2.6, 24% calculated load, these two guys. Now the, the injector pulse width, not a great one to go by because the computer is gonna take fuel away to put it there. That calculated load number though, is definitely, and that's our mass airflow gives us that. Okay, let me plug this back in. We, we might not be able to look at the pulse width number here. Math is plugged back in. You see how much higher our calculated load is? Our mass airflow grams per second is around four. And look at our, our pulse width is like significantly higher. Trims are way negative, which is gonna pull this, this pulse width back down. Okay, I'm gonna put math. Math, sensor, what's that, a Phillips? Why do they do that like that? What is this? Can't even see inside this one. Definitely not something I'm gonna be able to show you on camera. It looks clean, but that don't mean anything. This has like fluid film everywhere. Tough to call a math. I'm not gonna be able to show you this, guys. I'm sorry. It looks clean. It doesn't even look like one of the ones that will get contaminated. It's like down inside of there. So I, um, I unplugged the math uh -huh. and my trims look good. And my calculated load went from 44% down to 26%. Oh. And I, I've seen them where, you know, you get contaminants and they can overestimate airflow at idle speeds but I'm, I'm wondering too like this was this was all disconnected I, should, I need to maybe focus on plumbing a little bit here but this was disconnected that shouldn't I did that okay I wanted to look in there and see how the hell it got piped yeah you know I mean? yeah he's got the thing all freaking fluid film yeah everywhere I'm gonna clean this you got some math cleaner So Danner did this. That shouldn't matter. Sometimes airflow in front of a math can be a factor. So we'll have to inspect this box a little bit closer to be sure. Let's see what we got. I don't think that's gonna make a difference from what I've seen on that style. It's almost like there's a blue and a white painted resistor. They don't have the same contamination problems. Okay, starting it. Yeah, my calculated load's still up there at like 40%. Ejected pulse is way high. Close up, take all the fuel away. Read minus one on, on this guy. I'm no longer worried about that though. I'm not worried about the upstream. I don't like that the default strategy was so much less like at, you know, let's, let's go a thousand RPM, just get an idea. Kind of, kind of match what we were doing before. It's kind of a thousand right there. 
you see my calculated loads 35 percent we're like 26 percent at idle we're even higher all right Let's do something real quick just want to prove o2 function for you guys real quick i don't like a liquid source in front of a math but i just want to prove to you guys that this this upstream wideband sensor is fine so we're going to force it rich Come on. Is this even flammable? Nope. <laughs> non flammable. You're not supposed to burn brake clean anyway. Garb clean. There we go. I'd like to see a minus two on that wideband. Looks like minus one's all it's gonna give me. We already saw a minus one. I I'm calling the math on this, Danner. The fact that my unplugged calculated load number is half, and like you said too, this math is all over the place. I'm gonna check this housing real close too. There's something going on with this math. I'm going to call all four of them and get one for 10 bucks. Sweet. I like a $10 used mass airflow. Yeah. I'll, and, and that gives us, you know, you... Up, that way we're not spending 150 on something that's going to be impossible to prove without, like... Uh. Yeah, no, I, I... It's always tough to call a skewed mass airflow sensor. Like, I've had... I've had countless hours in some of our other case studies on trying to trying to prove it. Prove it. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was. Thinking. I just wanted to see if this housing looked cracked at all. But wouldn't that cause it to run lean? Well, it's in front of the math, so airflow is important. Like the way the air travels. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it doesn't look like it's. Maybe I should pull. Make sure there's even an air filter in here. I, I saw it from the back, but yeah. Make sure there's not like a piece of duct tape in there. Okay, there's a stink bug. Nice. Well, <laughs> we've had those do stuff before. I mean... But what if it got sucked up into here and was diffusing the air perfectly? I mean... <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that can't be. There ain't no freaking stink bug over, overestimating <laughs> airflow. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, but... Interesting, there's a diffuser right there. That would have been getting sucked into. You, you would think, like, and it might be. There's no, <laughs> there's no way. There's no way. Dude, it is possible. Just given what we're talking about, this, the airflow sensor sits right behind that diffuser, that air straightener. So it sits back here. And if the, and that was behind the air filter, so you know it was getting sucked onto there. Yeah, I don't know how often it just decided to go uh, there, you know. But I mean, like if you got that much airflow, it might. Uh, make yeah, it's a stretch. <laughs> I like a ten dollar. If this doesn't fix it, I'm ordering one. Tomorrow. Yeah, get us a ten dollar uh, mass airflow, and let's go with that first and see see how she does because. This, these rich, rich condition faults can get deep quick. You said this has a manifold tuning valve too, right? And like I said on- I didn't see any data parameters for it. It is not. It, it's, it's actually not even, like when you look at the codes that it can set, yeah. they're all circuit codes. So it only knows that the circuit's good, but it does not have a feedback circuit to see if it's working. Interesting. Okay. There's no way that's gonna fix it. We've had stink bug fixes before, but. All right, last check and we're gonna throw a part at it for $10. I mean, like you said though, I could do a scope test just to show the erratic nature of it too, you know? We'll see. We'll see what this looks like.
No, my calculated load's still high. Yeah. Look at this airflow, too. It's pretty significant to be changing that much. Let's smack on it. You should heat it. I'm gonna do it. This heat gun. Watch our calculated load and our math signal. Wistful thinking, wistful thinking. Okay, okay. Let's not be a parts changer. I'm gonna be a parts changer. Just a couple quick scope measurements for y'all. Remember the intake air temp sensor is part of this circuit. First pin. That's my intake air temp sensor signal. Of how steady that was. Sensor brown, I think. Middle wire looks like battery voltage. There's going to be two grounds on this. Snap the throttle. That's the one. Change our time base. Let's go one second. Peak detect is on. That's weird. All that hash in there on a snap. without peak detect on. This is with. It shouldn't look like that, even with peak detect turned on. Let's go to the graphing meter. Four, four volt peak, I've been teaching that forever. There is a lot of hash in there. Back to the lab scope. Yeah, that's not what I'm showing on the scan tool, man. At 1.4 volts, what's scan tool showing me? Oh, it's grams per second. It wasn't in voltage, that's right. There's a lot. We'll see what that looks like after we're done. So we're at 1.42 volt average, lots of spikes with peak detect on, five second screen. That's before, you know, snap it, you got all kinds. Turn peak detect off, you're still at your 1.4 volt average, 1.45. Snap throttle test, some spikes in there. And then we have calculated load of about 37. This is with engine warmed up fully, 206 degrees. About 40, we're, we're hitting about 40 calculated load with a uh, range for this math 
Let's stop it. Clear parameters. Nope. Range on the math, so like I saw a 4.5, 3.6 as the low. There's a 3.6, 3.6. I saw a 3.5 there momentarily. 3.5 to 4.8. Okay, there's your before numbers. We'll get you after numbers here in the next shot with our $10 used one. All right, guys, I'm back on the Suzuki. We have a part. Let me pull the old one out. Let's compare the two. This one looks a little bit different in the plastic housing. The plug is the same, but... Um, yeah, let me pull the other one out. Let's compare the two and um, see what happens. Uh, I gotta say, uh, while I'm working here, I apologize for the microphone from the first day footage. I did not know that I had a cable issue. There's a lot of fuzz in there. I'm using a different mic today and well, hopefully we can clean some of it up in post-production. All right, so this is a little bit different. But yeah, if you look at the sensor construction, you know, it's close to being the same. However, if you look like this one, which is the replacement, you can clearly see the resistors. And on this one, it has like, that's actually the best we've been able to see these resistors. So with this camera, you see the white and the black or white and blue coating on those. And then the plastic housing is a little different. There's like a little bit of, like some kind of diffuser here. Replacement doesn't look broken, but let's, let's see the part numbers. Oh, this is out of a 2007 and ours is what? Vehicle history, yeah, 2007, same model year. So what is different? Maybe one's aftermarket, yeah. This one to the left is a, looks like the factory part, Suzuki, Denso. And this one's a made in Taiwan. So that makes me feel better about our replacement piece. The fact that it's stamped Suzuki. So this one's a, a genuine Suzuki part, Danner. And the one that was in there was a made in Taiwan. Yeah, that's, that's why I wanted to get a junkyard one anyway, just to get an OE, just to see. Yeah. Yeah, and this who knows why he replaced that and why he, he thought it went bad it could have just been all the oil burning that he was doing you know what i mean originally yeah and, and you said this was replaced before the engine Two was years ago he said that was so, different not during the engine swap and he doesn't know when this rich condition developed i, I take it either um well after he put the engine in, it was misfired and he has a scanner and he's you know what i mean in the rich condition yeah, I have no idea. So I just wonder if he had that ever since the Back sensor was point. replaced yeah. and he just never knew or had check engine lights for other things and ignored it because he knew he had yeah. engine well, problems. Now he cares. So we might have just like a, a crappy aftermarket part type thing, huh? I hope so. Well, after seeing a 40% engine load, right? And then you disconnect And then disconnecting it, it goes to a 26 to 28 uh, um, percent engine load like that to me tells me that thing's over estimating overestimating airflow and then um you know for ten dollars it was worth going this route than to condemn you know check everything else out and then come back to the mass airflow which is really what you do yeah for sure so just like calling a computer you, yep. you know you got to do everything yeah, I mean, sometimes calling a module is the hardest thing, and a mass airflow sensor is a little module that, yeah, you know. You see something live where it's like, you know, got a whole bunch of hash running through it and all that. Yep, and this this one did have have hash, but we'll see what the new one looks like. More importantly, we'll see what the airflow looks like. I'm about to find out. Oh, just battery's probably dead. I usually like to have you guys on scan data before I start it, but you, you heard it, it barely started from the battery being weak. I wanted to get it running right away. We'll be able to tell still. I don't need the cold engine startup stuff. Hey, I got a minus 10 on long-term. That's a good sign. My idle's still a little bit high. I'm at a thousand RPM. I'm seeing um, a much, much steadier airflow grams per second, but we need to let this warm up. So looking at that number, 
my calculated load is still a little bit high, but my engine is still on cold, fast idle. My uh, total trim of minus five, that looks great. Look, that, or minus seven. Pa uh, positive on the short term of five, negative on the long term minus 10. Yeah, that's about a minus five total. This is fixed. Yeah. Yeah, this is fixed. 100%. Um, I, I need to get better uh, data for you guys. Um, let me exit out of here. Close this car out. Reload it again. Tough calling a mass airflow sometimes. An out of calibration mass airflow. The unplug it test isn't always your best friend. Why? Because not all cars have good default strategies. Number one. Number two is it's not perfect. I unplugged it and it got so much better. Um, that's a good indication when you see that, that you have a mass airflow problem. Um, I've seen other variables with the unplug it test with mass airflows. One of them in particular was on a uh, Pontiac G6 or something like that, that had a brake booster vacuum leak and it had negative trim or positive trim numbers, very positive. I'll, I'll put the link here for the, this one. It's a premium video. Um, and the issue with it was when you unplug the math, your fuel trims would go from you know, positive 25% or whatever down to near zero. So it looked like a mass airflow issue, but what it was was a vacuum leak. So that's what I'm talking about. The unplug it test isn't always your best friend, but it was a good guide for us for this one. And we use that as a way to say, okay, we're gonna stop in our troubleshooting. This isn't right. The unplug it test revealed something to us that said, hey, this mass airflow is out of calibration. And do we, do we continue at that point? We're not totally sure on the math. Do we continue to check all the other variables for the rich condition only to come back to the math like we've done many times before. Um, I'll put some other links of one that, that we did with a mass airflow issue that Caleb and I uh, ran around in circles only to come back to the math. <clears throat> and then weigh all of that with a used part we could get for $10. Yeah, it was way, way worth rolling the dice on that. Yeah, check it out. I got a plus 18% on short term and minus 20 on long term. Nice. That's what we want to see, that brother. That's what you want to see. Yeah. I, no, I don't. Uh, like an adaptive relearn so this thing don't go funky. I did that on a Ford once. I left it be and then it starts setting system. It might. I mean, we'll probably good. probably disconnect the batteries all, yeah. all, all need to do. Uh, my calculated load is now down at 30%. We're 40% before. So a 10% reduction there. What else are we looking at? I'm having trouble um, limiting these data parameters. My scan tool is being a little bit funny. But let's look at our air fuel sensor, the milliamp one, this guy. Remember that we only saw minus one when I forced it, but OBD Global was actually better. And yeah, we see our two on the lean side and minus one on the rich side. I added propane to this. I could only get it to go down to minus one. The weird part is the global data was more more uh, accurate than than this is, even though it was super slow. It was, it's still warming up, so my base pulse width is still a little bit higher than it was before. Uh, pulse width is difficult to use in troubleshooting because um, some of you may be thinking, well, why is the pulse width the same as it was before? Well, it's, it's, it's going to be whenever this warms up, and the answer to that is in, in one mode, your um, over fueling from the mass airflow, but then we're pulling it away from the oxygen sensor and fuel trim, and we're bringing that base pulse width down where it should be. Now we're not overestimating airflow, and our fuel trims don't have to counter for that, and so our base pulse width is the same. So that's why using pulse width to as a guide to before and after isn't really all that helpful. That is a fix. This is classic fuel trim adjustments here. When you see short-term fuel trim positive, long-term fuel trim negative, and there, you know, you it's the sum of the two. You now know before test driving the car, before relearning anything, you know that you fixed this car. Understanding fuel trim is absolutely key. And guys, I'll put a link here 
for a video I did eight, nine years ago on YouTube, and it's actually on my premium channel too on understanding short-term and long-term fuel trim. You need to watch that video. I'm very pleased by the numbers I'm seeing. Just wanna get our engine temperature up to where we were before. We were, we were about 200 degrees whenever I shut this off. Just kinda of warming it up. We can watch our short-term, long-term together. Yeah, you, know, you can see your bank one total trims. It's exactly what we're seeing, which is the difference between short term and long term. We got to get some grams per second numbers for you guys. Remember how erratic that grams per second number was? We also want to look at that on the lab scope to see the difference between them. Look how steady this airflow number is now, Danner. Remember? Because I remember seeing it changing a lot on me. And we were we were hovering from what I remember between like three and four. It was. And, wow. and you see how how steady that is yep. just from a from a scan data perspective all right so we'll, we'll get some scope readings for you guys remember when we deal with wideband sensors that they all operate a little bit differently from each other using the downstream sensor was very helpful for us so comparing that guy and that guy upstream downstream sensors from the very beginning um, it was helpful using that downstream sensor to interpret what the upstream was using. Really important piece in attacking our rich condition was making sure that the wideband upstream sensor was actually functional. And uh, again, a review, if you're unfamiliar with the data you're looking at in the OEM format, exit out, go to global mode, and a lot of that data is um, very uniform and what you're looking at and that'll help you understand um, what you're looking at in the OEM form. So an, an example of that I'm thinking of is like Nissan with their short-term and long-term alpha fuel trim. And you're like, I've never heard of that, where 100 equals zero. Well, when you go to global data on that same car, you will see short-term and long-term fuel trim listed as we're used to looking at as a 0% number instead of 100 that Nissan uses. And sometimes the wide bands will be reported differently on global as opposed to OEM. In our case, it was not, but you saw how much more sensitive it was in the global mode. This is fixed. Uh, last piece, I think, again, is to look at our lab scope of the mass airflow sensor. We're about 2.8 grams per second. You see our, calcul our calculated load too, guys, is right about where our unplug it test was. If I remember when I unplugged it, it was hovering around 26% calculated load from 40, 40% 40 down to 26% unplugged it. Default strategy, that default strategy was accurate on this car. And that unplug it test was the key in identifying a overestimating, over reporting mass airflow sensor. It was also worse at idle, and I wanna reiterate one more time with that, that some mass airflow sensors, when they're dirty, will overestimate airflow at idle speed only. But what you'll end up with in those situations is lean conditions under load. There is a difference with this one, wasn't there? This one was kind of, it was rich at idle, but then when I raised the RPM, it was normal. So that doesn't match that. The dirty maps I've seen, again, links for this too. I'm thinking of a Subaru was probably one of the better ones I had. It was like minus 10 at idle. And then when I raised the RPM, it was like plus 20. The codes in memory were P0171 and 174, lean exhaust codes. Hook up the scan tool, look at fuel trims at idle and they're minus 10. Problem with that car, dirty math. That's what made me think of that when we were on this one. Again, difference with this one is under load, it didn't go positive, it was normal. This is an overestimating over-reading mass airflow sensor, in particular at idle speeds. The answer to that, uh, parts go bad, uh, is one or two, a cheap part, cheap aftermarket part that was never calibrated properly to begin with, and he's probably had this problem the whole time that sensor's been in here. It's one of the two. Base pulse with 2.8 milliseconds. I think we were around 2.6 yesterday. It was, it was hovering around a lot more. This looks great. As far as the sensor milliamp goes, the one-one sensor, that will move a little bit. We're just not seeing it on here. Under the global mode, we saw it a little bit better. Fuel trims look great. I don't even need to disconnect the battery. We're now down to zero long-term, plus two short-term. Total trim, 
difference between the two, they have us at zero. That number's a little bit delayed from actual. This looks great. There's still some long-term memory there. Watch when I raise the RPM a little bit, how it went to minus eight. Let's see if I can hold it there. Yeah, minus eight, but then look, positive five on the short term. What's gonna happen when those balance out? It'll be like minus three. Yeah, this, this will be fine. Um, ideally, this, this being a customer's car, uh, you'd wanna go test drive it, make sure that um, you kinda enter all those different modes to have this relearn, number one or number two, you, wanna disconnect, you do wanna disconnect the battery, wipe out the trims, or if this has the option on the scan tool to do that, to wipe out the trim memory. Oh, I looked at the wrong number. When I was quoting that to you, I was looking at the mass airflow. I apologize, that last part, minus eight, positive five, minus three, right? I was looking at math, I think, when I quoted you that number. It was real close to being the same. So minus seven long-term, positive five short-term is a minus two total. There's your total trim. And again, that's a little bit delayed. Calculated though, 26% grams per second, 2.7. Um, this engine is a two liter, I believe. Is this a two liter? Yeah, two liter. Remember using grams per second numbers, um, a lot of us use this. Uh, the grams per second, you say how many liters is the engine? If it's a three liter engine at idle, we should see about three grams per second. That's pretty accurate. Four liter, four grams per second. The problem with that is under a three liter, if it's less than a three liter engine, that number no longer holds true. This is a 2.0 liter engine and I'm reading 2.7 grams per second and they can vary engine to engine. Why is that that the lower, smaller engines that doesn't really match? I can't answer that. This is just a class that I sat in. Very good uh, teacher, Eric Ziegler and um, he had mentioned that and I've been repeating that since and, and I'm finding that to be accurate. Less than a three liter engine, you can't use that number. But I like it. Let's go see what this looks like under the hood. We'll stay with the lab scope. I showed the graphing meter too, but it was essentially the lab scope without peak detect. They were the same. We'll keep peak detect on. Oh, it's significantly different. I need to go and rev the engine a little bit here. Yeah, that is with peak detect turned on. Let's go 10 volt. I think that's where we were. And let's go, I think five seconds. I, I believe that we did look at that on that trace. Wow, a lot more hash than I thought would be there. And I, you know, I was thinking that you, you reach for things when you're trying to make a call. Let me do a snap throttle test. That's with peak detect turned on. Here's with it turned off. Do we see a difference in the rev up? I think we do. The other thing too, guys, is I'm using battery ground for my reference and not sensor ground. Sensor ground would clean that up a lot too. I think I remember seeing like 4.1 on a peak. I'm okay with that. I think we did have a little bit more hash in this area uh, of the rev up before. It looks like this particular test wasn't all that helpful because there, here's what peak detect turned back on. It's awfully noisy, isn't it? I believe it's less noisy when we compare the two. What's your lesson on looking at mass airflow sensors with peak detect turned on? I don't know, turn it off, <laughs> that's your lesson. Or use sensor ground instead of battery ground. There's your idle. Back to scan data real quick. 
Nice. Long term, minus one. Short term, positive three. Love it. Mass airflow grams per second at idle, 2.7, 2.8. The range we were looking at, I remember looking at that and trying to call out numbers, the mid max. So I saw a 2.5 there. I saw a 2.9. 286, 285, 289, 293 as a peak with a valley, a min of 258. So about a 0 0.4 of a volt swing on that math. I remember seeing more than a, a volt swing or grams per second swing before. That's not volt, sorry. Seeing a grams per second swing that was a lot higher than that. And the overall average was much higher too. Again, calculated load. This is a fix, we're done. So lots of lessons in this one, lessons within lessons. Um, thank you guys for joining me. I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. Make sure you read this description for those other links I was talking about. Guys, thank you so much. We'll see you next time. One more piece, and this is to my brother who's walking over. In a condition like this, yes, the rich condition was compensated for, but this would be one where, depending on how old the oil is in here and how long he's been running it this way, now this is a newer engine and maybe the oil hasn't been in here very long, 50 miles, yeah. 50 miles then we're okay. But if this is a customer's car, you need to find that out because you might want to also do an oil change on top of it. You can have fuel contaminated oil, in which case we would see some negative trim numbers when you're done, um, you know, from the... Uh, rich condition of the PCV gases pulling those fuel vapors through just just remember that you have extended periods of rich conditions or lean conditions You're gonna want to recommend an oil change too